Over the last few years, we've learned a great deal about red deer in their natural habitat, filming on the Ardna Merkin Peninsula on the west coast of Scotland. This is where Neil Rowantree manages them, hunts them and studies them. So what happens when, 150 years ago, you ship deer from Scotland to the other side of the world, to a landscape which has echoes of Scotland, but is definitely not Scotland? New Zealand is a country without major predators, without any homegrown mammals to speak of at all, and a climate that optimises growth. This is a celebration of those deer and a global success story. Before we start on this red deer journey, we need to hear about the human journey. So let's begin in Scotland. I was always curious as to how it felt for people who were forcefully wrenched from this. Neil has brought us to a ransacked village on the Ardnamurkin estate. We know that right up to the 1830s, this was a, it was a, a village that had a population in it where people made a living from the land. And unfortunately a number of things occurred in the Highlands which brought about significant change. It was cleared in 1828 by the local laird to make way for a more efficient way of farming. The crops were torn up, the livestock killed, the houses destroyed and the people thrown to all corners of the globe. If you try and picture in your mind's eye being wrenched from a settlement like this against your will, packed onto a sailing ship, and the last thing you see of your home is you sail around that point. So for me, going to, uh, to New Zealand is going to be an, an incredible adventure, but it's also going to be a people story. I, I want to know what happened to uh, Highland people when they left here. They spent six months at sea and ended up in a new land that uh, they had to shape as their own. And I, and I think for me, the, the thing I want to investigate is to what extent the arrival of red deer in New Zealand and, and how they went from being a, almost a, a new sporting playground for the wealthy to an environmental challenge, to something now that the New Zealand people we're going to meet who are Highlanders by descent have turned into a world-class product. There's a, a connection between people and deer that I want to investigate, that I want to follow but also to see what we can learn there and bring back home and maybe adapt so that we can make wiser use of our resources so that we don't have to see things like this again where people became dispossessed. So anyway, an, an interesting journey lies ahead. We're about to leave the Morvan Hills behind us and travel several thousand miles to end up back in the Morvan Hills again and to see how Red Deer fared on that incredible journey. Scottish red deer were soon to follow the Scottish settlers to New Zealand. It was a land where the Scots could still be Scots. Here they could still play the pipes, wear clan tartan, and now hunt red deer. Our hosts on New Zealand's South Island are the Fraser family. Brothers Duncan and Hamish, with their father Andrew, run two successful red deer operations that work hand in glove. There's the farm. It is a large-scale venison producer for the European, North American and Asian markets. It also sells antler velvet. Harvesting the live tissue is banned in the UK, but as Neil will learn, venison and velvet products power the hunting side of the business, and as most hunters will know, New Zealand is the land of the giants. And it's not just the stags. So this is just the, uh, the perfect example of what uh, good genetics and good feeding does from uh, from, from what's historically come from well, Scotland. Well, <laughs> I'm still at the right height to headbutt you. you know? <laughs> I always have been quite conscious of where the families come from and what the background is. I've never really researched it and you know it's not something you, you first think about when you get up in the morning but I mean the fact that my name is uh, very Scottish, the fact I play the bagpipes, 
Um, I'd still say probably the city that I've enjoyed visiting the most in the world would be Edinburgh and the country that I've really enjoyed spending time in the most was going to visit Neil um, out at Art American. So um, I think there is a sense of belonging when you go back to, back to those roots. Um, but sort of just how you describe that, it's uh, not that easy. It will make it grow bigger to a certain point. Yeah. But that's like me, you know, my father's... Younger brother Duncan runs the Vanatour Cardrona Safaris operation. One of their lodges is in Wanaka, on the southern part of the South Island, which is where we will be based for part of our stay. Neil has been invited to shoot a stag in the surrounding terrain, and a tar bull further up country. The tar is another imported game species that has flourished here. Duncan and Hamish have worked hard to promote Venato Cardrona and it now attracts clients from all over the world because they have the biggest red stags in the world. A few examples line the entrance to the lodge. We'll learn more about the development of these heads in the next episode of Planet Deer. For now, Neil wants to get a sense of what happened to the Scottish Reds after being released into the wild. In a nutshell, they boomed. When they reached epidemic proportions, they were shot and left on the hill in return for a bounty. However, one man saw a business opportunity. That man was Sir Tim Wallace. To Neil's surprise, there's a whole section of a local museum dedicated to the evolution of the New Zealand red deer industry and the captain of that industry. This whole section here is devoted to the efforts and the, the inspiration of Sir Tim Wallace who, for anybody that's keen in red deer, and particularly has any knowledge of what happened in New Zealand, would realise that uh, Sir Tim and what he developed as a business had huge influence on the management of red deer, the development of deer-related products, and uh, basically New Zealand venison as a brand around the world. So from a very early start, where they put a few carcasses to New York, they, they developed a massive industry that uh, shaped deer for future years. So uh, it was exceptional what they achieved here and, and it led eventually to Sir Tim being uh, knighted for services to the deer industry, development of deer farming and for being an entrepreneur. A year ago we were talking about deer products, you and I stood in a, a, a chill on the west coast of Scotland and, and looked at deer puzzles uh, and sinews and here we are here on the dis display today looking at the final products that these eventually became part of that actually fed into what we do in Scotland today as well because they opened up and created the markets that a lot of our byproducts go into to this very day. So I think having looked at the images on display and the information that's available it's only fitting now and we've been fortunate enough that we're going to actually go and speak to one of the Wallace family and Jonathan has agreed to give us a bit of his time and he's a busy man but he's going to basically talk us through how this all happened, how it was developed and where it's taken them to today. We find Jonathan Wallace across the way at a very busy airfield. Tourists pay big bucks to see New Zealand from the air. Some hunters choose the same route dropped off in remote areas for a hunt of a lifetime. It's a sensible way to travel and all this started thanks to Sir Tim's vision. Jonathan, thank you for taking time to speak to us here today. What I'd love is if you've got five minutes just to explain to us how, how it all came about. Yeah, uh, actually my father who uh, is 80 this year, he was one of the pioneers of the industry. So all mammals in New Zealand were introduced essentially, except for a fur seal and a native bat. By introducing red deer and, and various goats and rabbits and things, there were no natural predators to control those animals. By the 1950s and 1960s, uh, the populations were extreme and we were getting a lot of erosion in the mountains, um, degradation of our, of our native forests. And so the government post the Second World War introduced um, culling programs and they would, they would employ uh, ground hunters to, to, to shoot animals, um, paid a bounty on their tails, um, and in later years they would collect their skins. But my father, he saw this as a, a, as a real waste, that they were leaving these animals on the hill. And so in April 1963, they, they hired a helicopter that was surplus to the, the Korean War. And they had a group of ground shooters move through a valley and push these animals up into a big basin. In the end, they recovered um, almost 200 deer. And what it showed at the end, there was a market for it. He gradually built up a fleet of helicopters. So it wasn't unusual for a helicopter and a team 
to shoot and recover 100 deer a day per helicopter and it peaked at around 70,000 carcasses that were exported. The commercial extraction of deer eventually peaked and then dropped in the 1970s as the number of wild deer fell. This led to a further innovation, so Tim developed live capture of reds for farming. And it's interesting for them as a business that, the, the, that Sir Tim, his father, developed the whole thing right the way through from uh, deer just being left lying in glens, right the way through to using velvet, to using pizzles, to using bone, to using blood products, and to actually creating a market of venison export that very quickly became sort of, you, you could say, a, the, the leader in the world. And, and as a kid, I can remember people talking about New Zealand venison. And when we aren't in New Zealand, people talk about the threat of New Zealand venison. And it's interesting to see it here, when they talk with pride about developing a product. And, and it's been really interesting through the sport hunting, right through to the discussions we've had on control and culling of, of what was really a non-native species. And now it's going to be interesting now to see how it developed further into deer farming. The sight of deer carcasses being carried underneath choppers is not one that everyone likes. Certainly in the UK, Neil had first-hand experience of this in Scotland and the resulting PR fallout. Because a lot of our viewers are UK-based, helicopters and deer have always been a very uh, contentious subject. And I think at the outset, my own opinion I'd like to make is that helicopters are a, are a very useful and practical vehicle for managing wildlife. And because they're so manoeuvrable, they can go into all sorts of terrain that other things can't. And, it, and the thing about helicopters, it's the ethics of how you use them. It, it's not really the vehicle itself, it's a vehicle like any other. And to transport deer from remote areas or people into remote areas, they take an awful lot of beating. And, and I think uh, what we'll see here and what's developing as we do this story in New Zealand is how important the, the helicopter was in uh, developing not only deer control, but also in developing uh, deer management and deer farming. And I, I think it's been an important part of the journey and an important connection to make. The simple fact is that if you need to shift large numbers of a perishable commodity from tough terrain to market, you need to use a helicopter. We leave the airfield for a little bit of retail therapy. And a beer. Our last stop of the day is a pub, not just any pub. I wanted to go there because it had been the, the home of the Ludgate meat packers, which is where, uh, when the deer had first started coming off the mountains in any volume in New Zealand, this was one of the places they were being processed and handled. And uh, the last time I walked into a bar like that was in the, the middle of Sutherland at a place called the Garvault. And it, yeah, it was like stepping back in time. And I think the thing that fascinated us was that uh, the bar itself is a celebration of what went on there. I mean, the walls are adorned with pictures of deer control activities and, and handling deer and people culling deer and helicopters in action. And everybody coming and going from the bar just saw that as commonplace. And, and that's come out through this whole journey. A, a very large percentage of New Zealand people hunt or fish. And therefore, culturally, the, the disconnect between urban and rural doesn't really seem to exist to the same extent here as it does at home. And uh, if governments in the UK, and particularly north of the border, are keen to get uh, the community more involved in the management of natural resources, there are lessons to be taken from New Zealand. And what's interesting here is that in Scotland, they look for a huge change in how they influence private land ownership. Whereas uh, New Zealand has pioneered the use of natural resources on public land, where the man on the street can go and hunt in government blocks uh, at the rower and fill his freezer for the year. And uh, that can be venison or it can be tar. So we've still got to really question why at home we spend millions of pounds shooting deer when we could develop something similar to what they have in New Zealand where the man on the street gets an opportunity to go and manage uh, a natural resource in his native land. Next time on Planet Deer, Neil hunts tar and learns why New Zealanders lead the world in farming red deer. <laughs>